With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. Hey guys, welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors, Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash holly. That's 30 days for free, dipsystories.com slash holly. Okay, let me introduce my guest today. She started her career by writing reviews of sex toys on her blog. Now she's an award-winning fat-positive sex worker, taking up her well-deserved space in the femdom and mommy-dom communities. Please welcome your big, milky mommy girlfriend, Gwen Adora. Hi, Gwen. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, no, it's absolutely a pleasure. Thank you so much. I've been like following you for a while and I, I love all your content. So I definitely was like, I got to have her on the show. She seems like so much fun. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I like to think I'm a lot of fun. <laughs> you definitely come across as like a bubbly, like positive, like energetic person. Is that what you would say your persona is generally like on a day-to-day basis or is that just a I know, no, that's like a me, a hundred percent, both work-wise and personally. I'm, a, I'm almost an eternal op- optimist, and I just love bringing joy and positivity to spaces. Oh, what's that like? I, I need <laughs> more people like that in my life. <laughs> well, hello, <laughs> hi. <laughs> okay, well, let's start at the beginning. Um, tell me about what inspired you to start your sex toy blog. Oh yes, um, that was a while ago, um, but I wanted free sex toys <laughs> and I, I was on Twitter and I was just kind of like needing a change up in my life. I was like, Hey, I need a project, I need something to do. And I found a blogger, um, Kate Sloan, um, who's goes by girly juice. And she was like, just like living her life on Twitter, doing sex toy reviews and running a blog talking about sex. And I was like, Oh my goodness. I've always had such a, you know, love, um, for, like sex positivity as I was kind of growing out of high school into college. And I was like, this is probably a spot where I could kind of put my thoughts, put my feelings and also get free sex toys in exchange for reviews. So I Bonus. started, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So I started that blog and I was under like a different branding than my Gwen name. Um, and it, I was pretty successful at it, but eventually I just kind of got a little bored of writing and also giving away a lot of like, my personal details of like my sex life and uh, my personal life to the internet. So I shifted um, from that into porn eventually. Interesting. Um, Have you always been a sexual person? Uh, Yes, definitely. Um, When I was um, younger, like I was just always masturbating (laughs) and um, I always wanted to have sex like in high school and stuff. I didn't really have like a lot of um, like, romantic in like interests um well I I did but it was very unrequited in terms of like crushes in school but I was someone who was like always like I was like I really couldn't like couldn't not wait to get fucked like I was just very excited to experience that next stage of um growing up and when I first had sex at 
like at 18, I kind of just kind of like I did it to with the person I did it with just to kind of like open the doors and just to get myself going. And then I uh, fucked way too many people, <laughs> but but uh, um, it brought me here. So that's uh, that's wonderful. I made some mistakes along the way, but um, I just kind of was like ready to get going. Yeah, I I can relate. I remember when I lost my virginity, I, it was just to like do it. You know what I mean? It, there was such a buildup to it. And all my friends had already lost their virginity. So I've, I've talked about the lost my virginity story. It's not very interesting. And it was to a guy who did not deserve it. Yeah, um, but nice. uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you got to start somewhere, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you grew up in like a pretty sex positive household. Is that right? Yeah. My mom was always very um, like, I mean, looking back at it, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, okay, maybe she could have approach things a little bit differently but she was always very open with us about like hey if you guys watch porn that's cool and she she was came to me like when I was young and was like hey just so you know like if there's like a spot like it was very big she's like there's mm -hmm. a spot you can touch that makes you feel really good and I was like okay cool um and I've been masturbating every day ever since um <laughs> but like I mean there's definitely some I think more communication that could have happened but I think she was doing um, the best that she could at the time, um, when I was growing up. So I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, being a mother now and also growing up in a sex positive household, I definitely, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that we have so many more tools and information at our disposal to teach our kids about sexuality in a healthy and, and positive way. Um, what do you think were some of the things that you might have done differently or like how do you see the approach of teaching someone about sexuality in a healthy way now with all the information that you have I think I mean if I had to change it I think giving me a little bit more information on like why like things were happening that way mm -hmm. and like why this feels good and what context and maybe some also like more like talks about like my relationships to potentially other people and also my like relationship to like sexy internet media. Um, mm -hmm. That would be, I think really helpful. Cause I think that was kind of like something I had a lot of shame about like watching porn um, and specifically like watching like a lot of like queer porn, because that was something that I was like, wait, like I typically growing up, I had a lot of crushes on guys, but I would like masturbate to like lesbian porn, which I feel like is like, that's very standard for a lot of women. And if like, not that my mom would have had like the answers to that at all, but I would kind of like, if I was to, you know, impart some information onto a growing person, I would kind of guide them in a way that would give them tools to understand those types of relationships. Um, Cause yeah, even though I wasn't really like, again, I was pretty, I didn't have any boyfriends growing up, but it would still have been nice to like understand just a little bit more rather than like, oh, by the way, if you touch yourself, it feels nice, but like a little bit more context behind that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, you're obviously younger than me, so you grew up in a different era than I did because the internet didn't exist when I was growing up. So my parents didn't have to worry about me. I mean, to be fair, I used to steal like, you know, because my parents were pornographers, so I, the content was literally at home. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like in the office, which was at the guest house. It was like locked in the office, but like I knew where the key was. Yeah, so, yeah. but you know, the only things that I would have access to is mostly magazines, which mm -hmm. is so tame compared to like what kids can get these days. Absolutely. And, you know, some like me. VHS tapes. That's, that was my first porn experience was a VHS tape and, and same thing, like pretty tame stuff, mm -hmm. um, compared to, you know, what's out there now. I mean, what do you think, what do you think about like this, you know, how to navigate this new internet age of porn, um, for young people? Oh my gosh. That's like such a loaded question. Um, yeah, it's like expansive. Cause I feel like there's kind of no, right way but there's like so many wrong ways of dealing with teaching youth about the media that they're consuming and I don't know I feel like parents are gonna mess up regardless but I guess just just talking to people talking to like their children about it I think is the most important thing just being like hey you're gonna probably see some things that like aren't realistic like depictions of sexual experiences 
Um, but even beyond that, like, even with like TikTok and um, like, even like place like, I don't know, Twitch communities. And like, um, if you think of, yeah, discords and like, just there's so many different types of online interaction now. And it's not just like the media that you're consuming, but it's also the people you're talking to and the relationships um, that you're forming. And because I think of a lot of people my age, like I'm 27, a lot of people like in my age range are like, oh, I had a really weird experience on the internet talking to a stranger and having some kind of like weird sexual experience at a young age with like someone they didn't know online through some weird chat room. And I think that stuff is definitely still happening, but maybe even in like more obvious areas of existence, just because so many youth these days are like very visible online. So it's like, of course, there's going to be like, you know, other people who are like interested in that, whether it be in their age range or just the creepy adults. Like, I think that kind of area needs to be like explored and talked about as well in also like with the porn conversation, because I don't know, like anything can be horny <laughs> realistically. And um, a lot of people make things horny, especially when you're sharing that types of media. Yeah. I mean, I think for the first part is that I think, you know, and I think about this obviously more now that I'm a parent is that is to not bury our head in the sand. Right. And just pretend like porn on the internet doesn't exist mm -hmm. and that our kids would never look at that stuff. Like start there, right. Acknowledge that it's there. And then, and then open up the discussion to how do you teach your, you know, talk to your kids about that in like a healthy, positive way. And there are resources out there for that. Mm -hmm. There are people who specialize in that. I actually interviewed um, a woman named Justine Angfonte, who specifically teaches porn literacy to youth, like awesome. I think high schoolers. Um, and obviously she doesn't show them porn, um, but she's able to discuss it in a way where they kind of like get context behind it, um, you know, and understand about it just being a fantasy and understand it in relationships to like real life um, <clears throat> interactions. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, start with education, right? Because if you just like refuse to talk to your kids about it and you just let them like discover it on their own, then, you know, you're liable to have issues there. So Absolutely. like, let's, 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 let's try to talk about it. Let's try to be open about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did you go from writing about sex toys to actually like making content where, how did that transition come about? Well, on my blog, I had a lot of horny readers who uh, were interested in, you know, my sex life that I was sharing. So was, there's kind of some overlap in between, I would say like the porn buyer community and also the types of people who were reading my blog. I also had like a lot of sex worker friends who would share my articles too. So it's kind of like in the same adjacent community um, with the sex bloggers and the sex workers. And yeah, I just had a couple of um, like readers who emailed me and were like, hey, I'd be interested in paying you for like a couple pieces of content here and there. So I started doing that a little bit. And uh, eventually I was like traveling um, in my early 20s and I needed some money. And I was, I was talking with, um, I was like in LA actually, and I was talking with some sex bloggers who also had a Patreon at the time when Patreon allowed porn. And they were like, you should do this. Like, this is like, it's ridiculous that you're not like adding this kind of like ability to make money um, into your like business plan. And um, I was like, okay, well this, like I need money right now. So this is probably like a good idea. <laughs> and then I just started my a Patreon that was kind of like um, linked to like my blog persona and I uh, started there <laughs> eventually though I um, kind of was like oh wait a second um, sites like many vids and like um, like other types of like where you could sell your content to like people who were there to buy it those types of sites I was like okay maybe I should kind of move over there eventually because it's like a bigger market and actually start marketing myself as someone who does this rather than just kind of like a adjacent aside to my blogging. And um, yeah, I saw that and I was like, okay, well, let's perhaps pivot, do a little pivot. So I was just kind of exhausted and burnt out from writing and sharing. And um, yeah, I pivoted. <laughs> How was it to come out like from behind just the words, you know, on the page to like a real 
person who was like showing herself to the world? Ooh, it was a little terrifying. I think of the first like couple times that I was sharing that type of content, I had already like on my blog, had already posted like sexy pictures and stuff before, but I think making someone specifically for one person felt very vulnerable when you're first like getting into that. And I think everybody's like first foray into like online sex work. You're like, Oh, like there's like a person I don't actually know at the other side of this, who's receiving this very like intimate piece of myself. And like, what could they do with that content? What are their intentions behind it? Whether it just to be jerk off to it in the best case scenario, which for some people that might even be something they're uncomfortable with, or like perhaps use it for nefarious purposes of blackmailing or uploading to like other sites and sharing it. And yeah, it was just like, obviously, yeah, all the possibilities run through your mind when you're doing something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. But I just did it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Were you, so were you worried about like, did, did your family or friends not know what you were doing? Were you worried about that coming out and affecting you in a negative way? And actually, no, not in that scenario. Like my parents kind of knew that I was doing like blogging and um, I explained to them kind of as I was doing it um, that that was the case. But in terms of switching over, I didn't really like, I didn't say anything to them, but I also wasn't really hiding it when I was moving into like the more porn space. Um, Like if I was nominated for like an award or something like that, or like if I was in an article or something, I would still like share it on my personal Facebook where my, which my family like has access to. It was kind of one of those things where I was like, like, you know, they'll like, if they find out, they find out, but it's not something I directly was ready to like engage with, with them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have a complicated relationship with my parents. It's like a little bit distant Um, and we're in like, we're in a good place now, but it's still like distant in a way that's comfortable for me and um, sharing something like that wasn't like the biggest worry of mine. And just because it wasn't a big priority. Right. Um, right. And then with my friends though, like they, they all knew what I was doing and um, like everybody in my personal life, like, like everybody knows. And like, I go by Gwen now, like very like publicly around my city and um, which is very freeing just because I don't have to ever really worry about someone trying to like, you know, blackmail me now, but At the time when I was transitioning to it, it was still a little bit of like a, oh, okay, this like could just perhaps backfire, especially because you're like, oh, the internet is so vast and big and scary sometimes. But um, yeah, I think it all worked out. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and also too, you know, we hear all these, these stories about like revenge porn and, you know, it's one of those things that you can't take back. Like what's on the internet is there forever. Right. So it needs to be a decision that you are like a hundred percent committed to. Absolutely. What advice would you give to anybody looking to get into online sex work? Is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known back then? Yeah, I get asked um, quite frequently from like local people in my city. They're like, oh my gosh, like I really wish I could do what you do. Like, like, can I get your advice? But typically when they're asking me this, it's usually like at a party or like when people are like at a club, like, and it's like, you're like, okay, this is like, how am I supposed to condense like I don't know all of like my or like some advice into like a nugget that you're going to take home with you and like actually think about um so I typically say to people I'm like okay think of like everybody in your life that like including like coworkers, professors like family members your best friends your brother everybody think of everybody in your life and like if ever or, or perhaps the, the person that you wouldn't want to find out like the most like that person think of them and then think of them finding out that's and then if you're uncomfortable with that then maybe that's something that you still need to sit on and you know like work on with yourself or if perhaps if it's not feeling right that this not might not be the industry for you um so that's the, the first thing I say and if they're like oh like I don't I don't care like or you know they're like I don't I'm fine I'm open with everybody and I'm like okay um so then I like I'm like okay what like you're going to have to think of a business plan. That's basically what I say to them. Um, so so many people, um, who are interested in this industry are like, obviously the money is like great and like alluring. Um, and obviously like a necessity too, for people who like, you know, like, I don't have any other options. We have to do this. Um, but also a, a lot of people that I talk to are interested in doing it kind of like they like the glamour and the kind of like mysteriousness and like, just like 
the kind of the, the edge factor of being able to say that they're doing it. Um, so I'm like, the advice that I give people is honestly very boring because like, to make it in this industry and to be successful, you have to have a good like business plan and a good idea of how to market yourself. And obviously like you, no one needs that from the get go, but eventually it's something that you're going to have to think about if you want to, you know, survive in like longevity wise and make a, mm -hmm. a career for yourself. So I'm like, <laughs> typically I tell people like some actual actionable advice and I say like, okay, you're going to have to, like think of your like what what are you selling like just like you're not selling like your tits are great your ass is great your face is beautiful but like what is your take on on this how are you going to get people to actually buy your content if you want to sell it so like what what's your niche what is your branding like think of that and then come back to me and maybe we can discuss like you know some more actually like you know tips that of and how to start but if you don't have an idea of what you want to do and what kind of content you want to make initially, then like you, like you're, you haven't really been thinking about this that long. And then it, maybe mm -hmm. it's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of people, I mean, especially nowadays get in, just think like, Oh, you know, if I flash my tits on the internet, people are going to pay for it because like everybody does and, and look at all these people making money. But I mean, the market has become like oversaturated, especially since COVID and everybody mm -hmm. jumped in and started doing OnlyFans. So I would say it's not as easy to, you know, carve out that niche and get those followers as it may have been before. So I think you're absolutely right. Like, what is your specialty? Um, you know, what do you think you're good at? Who's your audience? Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like that. And And you're right. Maybe you won't figure that out until you start you know, you dip your toe in sex work because I've just talked to a lot of women who really didn't like discover who they were sexually until they started doing sex work. Mm -hmm, like, they didn't mm -hmm. know because they hadn't had that much experience. And then they started doing sex work. They're like, Oh, I actually really like this. And so then that gave them some indication, but I think that's all, that's all really good advice. Um, we're going to take a commercial break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about your specialty. Um, the femme mommy dom role. So uh, hang tight, guys. We will be right back. With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. Hey guys, welcome back. All right, Gwen, so you do a lot of the femdom, mommy dom role. Um, talk us a little bit about how you discovered that that was your niche and what you enjoy about that. Oh, yeah. Um, it took me a little bit to start doing femdom and like mommy dom stuff in the industry. Because when I first started, it was a lot of like throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what stuck. Just I was like looking at what other people were doing a little bit too much and being like, oh, I can try to do like a million fetishes, you know, just to kind of like widen the net of things that I was doing. But I think in doing so, like I, because I hadn't established myself in any particular area that I was like casting the net too wide in terms of like, I wasn't known for anything yet. So I didn't like, I was offering too much to people. Um, and it's kind of like unsustainable to do that when you're first starting because like if someone's coming to you for like someone sees you you're selling a foot fetish video and they're super into feet they're like okay I'll buy this but then they look at the rest of your content and it's like every other fetish but not foot fetishes it's not they're not really coming back 
um, because you're like seldomly, you know, narrowing in on what they'd like. Um, so I think that was kind of like one of the mistakes that I made initially while entering. I mean, I definitely like had fun with a lot of different video concepts. Um, but that was, if I could go back and do it again, I would very much just like the advice I gave, like niche down initially and then start expanding from there. And um, at the time I joined the industry, I was identifying as more submissive in my personal life. So I thought that's kind of like, I was like, oh, I'll bring this on camera as well. Um, but I didn't find those videos like were like really like selling for me. And I just wasn't, I don't know. I, just, I, I felt I also was like having a shift in my own personal perception of what that meant to me as well. So I kind of was started to shy away from that. And I think it was um, my first like really bestseller video, um, which is called Practice Makes Pregnant. Um, it was an impregnation fetish video that was a custom video and it sold like ridiculously well. And it's still like one of my bestsellers um, on many bits specifically. And that role um, that the, the custom buyer like wanted from me was to be in a more like dominant role, but not necessarily something that is um, not like what you typically think when you think like a dominant woman in porn would be. Um, it's more like a kind of like a sexy, um, the, like, I mean, the, the story from the custom video is that I am the like best friend of the girlfriend of the POV character. And I am seducing him into fucking me and giving me a baby. <laughs> so from that kind of perspective um, and the way I like acted it and the way I kind of got into the script, it was dominant in a way that I wasn't really used to like experiencing outwardly. Um, a lot of yeah, domination style is like, oh, like, you know, you're whipping, you're spanking, you're like choking people and holding them down. But this is something more like subtle and verbal about that that made me be like oh wait a second I actually am kind of dominant because I really didn't think I was before and something about that and then we ended up end up doing like a a series of the same like character um and same types of storylines that kind of unlocked something in me that was like okay like domination doesn't have to just be this like super aggressive thing uh for me it's like my style of domination is very it's condescending it's nurturing um, and it's like, like a slightly evil, but in a like cheeky way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What do you think it, I mean, so I know like the impregnation fetish or like the breeding fetish, which is also known as, is like so popular. Why do you think that is? Oh, I mean, <laughs> there's a, like the idea of fucking raw, I think is just hot to everybody in general. So I think it kind of like gets people in initially, but then there's something about like, like it's something so physical, like the idea of like giving someone a baby and like being like here, there's physical evidence of like mm. sex happening here. And like, almost like, I think some body ownership stuff as well. I think that kind of intermingles with each other. And with the series that I did, it was also like a home wrecking series, like cheating series too. So that together kind of like created this like just very taboo topic. And I think that's what, I don't know, people love taboo stuff. So they uh, they love seeing that. And I think also with um, like, you know, the, the times in life right now of, um, you know, it's people don't want to get pregnant, but some people are forced to in certain areas. Like I think oddly enough that ties into, you know, the, the more taboo aspect of like pregnancy. Yeah. It's so interesting how like human sexuality takes like current, you know, topics and issues and kind of twists it in a way that's like the, our way of like handling, um, you know, problems in our, in our life, in our world. But yeah, I think what you said about like the body ownership thing, I think that's a huge part of it because mm -hmm. like, how could you better prove that you had sex with someone than to like literally transform their body and their life by yeah them having a baby. So like there is like a very dominant um, aspect to that. So it's, yeah. it's just, it's really interesting to me. Yeah. And it's fascinating because like typically in the roles that I do now with my impregnation stuff, I'm the dominant one, not like the person who's like fucking me. Like I mm -hmm. wish it's usually like POV style, um, which is funny because I think a lot of breeding content, it's like the person being bred is the submissive person. 
But for mm-hmm. me, it's like I am forcing the viewer to give me their cum so that I can get pregnant. So it's like right. kind of like a fun like flip of the coin in that sense. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very interesting. Um, your content is very fat positive. And I wanted to actually talk about that word specifically because, you know, that is a word that, you know, has been used obviously in a negative way. Um, but you've, you seem to have reclaimed that word. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so like I have been a like bigger person, a fat person, um, since I was young, um, all my body's changed like over the years in many different ways, but, um, like I've had severe like body issues when I was in my youth, um, just due to like, you know, familial, like my, like family telling me that like I was fat and like my, I remember specifically like my grandmother, um, telling me like when I was like 10 years old, like you are fat and like, that is bad. And that was something that like took me a long time to unlearn. And in, um, and actually in moving through like my journey and my career, that is something that has like really affected how I view my body. So in like the first couple of years of university, that was kind of when I went through like a really big like realization of like other people are telling me how I should feel about the vessel that I am like using to <laughs> move through this lifetime. And there's just so much bigger things to worry about than like the perception that is being put on to me and the perception that's like, you know, made up by, of course, like, you know, just the media, (laughs) which is sounds funny to, you know, blame that, but it's very much, you know, all trickles down. And um, yeah, through like being like, like using my blog at the time and showing my body online, that kind of like sparked this actual confidence. Cause initially it was very much a fake it till you make it situation of like, I need to like pretend that I am the fucking shit <laughs> in order to get there, which it really did like over time end up working. Cause like, I really do. I love myself a little too much now, if you will. <laughs> uh, um, but like, there, it's sad. Cause I don't know. There's so many people that I still talk to like within our industry and outside of it. That's like, Oh, like they don't have, uh, they haven't really done the work themselves to um, undo what has been put upon them throughout their lifetime. And it's unfortunate because a lot of that is like obviously out of people's control. But when you don't examine your own relationship to the ideas that are being put upon you, then you're also typically pushing those upon other people at the same time. So um, like, even, I don't know, I get compliments from people when I go out and oftentimes it's like, oh my gosh, like you're so confident. Like, I wish I, like, I wish I could be so confident like you. And I'm like, you absolutely can. <laughs> like you have the ability to do that. You just have to like really do the work to, yeah, unpack that all and like start really loving yourself. And that's like, that's, I obviously won't say that to people <laughs> like because that's, you know, that's a, kind of like a harsh reality of it. But um, I'm at a point where it's, um, I know I've moved through like, you know, obviously the, the body positivity movement, um, like, which, you know, was initially like made by black women and disabled people. Um, obviously that was co-opted by white women kind of like early in the like early um, 2010s. And um, it's kind of moved into other space in the internet now, which is kind of, uh, you know, it's a very, we're at an interesting little time right now with our bodies, I think, because um, like they're saying like, cocaine chic is back or whatever in terms of body types being on trend very odd um we've kind of like moved through it it's never perfect but um yeah I feel like there's just like so, there's so always so, so much work to be done in terms of like people relating to their bodies but um fat specifically um as a word for me is just like that's just a descriptor of my body and like I I'm so happy that I was kind of unable or I am so happy that I was able to kind of release the like the negative ideas around the word um, because it really realistically is just a descriptor. And um, I still like when I say, oh, like I'm a fat person to people, their faces like like you can just see it in people's eyes like like like, no, you're not fat. And it's like or or it's like huh, like. Are you, are, are, am I allowed to say that about you? Like it's a, very interesting. So people have such a everybody has such a weird relationship to that word. Um, but it is like it's a, just a descriptor. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, I can really, and I will say that I am definitely one of those people who looks at you and is like, you're so confident. I wish I was that confident. And when I talk to people like you and, you know, when I had like Carla Lane on and I mean, I just like the idea of being able to get to a place where you love your body as it is, is like just this, it's, it's like, I can't decide if I want to like, I mean, I know what I should, but like internally, I can't decide if that's the goal I should go for, or if I should try to lose these last 10 pounds. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? And it's just, you know, as, as a woman who grew up in the industry where like, I mean, especially when I started shooting porn, you know, in 1999 or early or like 2000, like it was like skinny girls, big fake tits, like, Mm -hmm. you know, bigger women were never we we would never shoot them. We would never book them. There was like no place in like the little glamour niche that I worked in. So I think that very much conditioned me. And, you know, now that I'm older and I've had a child um, and my body has changed, it's like that struggle to accept myself as I am has been really hard. And so Mm -hmm. I have to, I will say like, personally, I'm, I very much admire you um, for being able to just like I mean, I feel like that's what we all want in the end, right? We just want to love ourselves, Mm -hmm. but it's like, how do we get there? Do we accept ourselves for who we are? And we, and we, you know, like you said, unlearn everything that's been taught to us about like what we're supposed to look like, or do we, you know, go to the gym every single day and eat nothing until we get to this like tiny size that, you know, we Mm -hmm. think is going to make us happy. And then of course, like when you get to that size, are you happy? No, no, (laughs) no, No, you're not. (laughs) I think there's like a world where you can kind of like in terms of like the saying like, do I love myself or do I like lose 10 pounds? I think there's a world where those things can like exist. I don't think it's necessarily like, oh, like just because like, I think you can still, you can still change your body depending on whatever you'd like to, but like also know why you're doing that. And like, like if you have a goal for yourself whether that be like you want to change your nose or you want to get a boob job or whatever. Like, I think people should absolutely be able to do those things. There's changes about my body that I'd love to make, but it's like kind of unpacking why first, um, Mm -hmm. because like, if it's directly related to like, I hate this about me, like let's change it. Maybe just like take it back a little bit and like really, really look at that. Um, before you make any changes um but although i'm at the same like i i agree that if you really really hate something about yourself like and you want to change it you should be allowed to i don't think anybody can tell anybody what they shouldn't shouldn't change because it's like again we only have like this is like this is my vessel for my lifetime like this is this body is carrying me through life right now um i should like be able to do whatever i'd like with it but at the same time i should allow myself the grace of just being who I am and being okay with myself, like where I am right now, whether that be a change I want to make, or if I'm feeling good, like this body is carrying me through and like, it's all I got. So I better treat it with respect and, um, and with love. Yeah. No, but you bring up a good point about, you know, if there are things about yourself that you want to change, you should feel entitled to make those decisions, but, but you're right to unpack and look at like, why is it like, you know, is it like your boyfriend or your husband Mm -hmm. that's making you feel that way? And because he's telling you that you feel like you need to change this for him. Is it for, you know, this, this job that you want or work, or is it for you? And it's like, that's, that's the hard thing, right. Is to really kind of uncover all of those layers and figure out like, what's your real motivation behind that. And I think that's, that's one of the hardest things to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, like being in this industry is really interesting just because like when I'm scrolling on Twitter, you're seeing like so many different, like you're seeing like, bo- like bodies. You see like you're, oh, I'm almost overexposed. I'm sure everybody in this, like in this industry is overexposed to um, different bodies, which is good in some ways, but then in other ways, typically, you know, algorithmically you're fed the bodies that like are, you know, conventionally attractive and fit like, you know, a certain, um, you know, certain boxes. Uh, so for me, like, it's like, uh, I tell this to my friends and sometimes they're like, what are you talking about? But I'm like, 
my perception of of my boobs specifically I'm like and I have got pretty big boobs I think my boobs are small in comparison to the industry because I'm so overexposed to like people who have like really big boobs and yeah. that's ridiculous but and, like some of my friends like literally look at me and they're like like they're like because I'm like you know what if I had the option I would have bigger tits because I just really love big tits um on myself and on other people um uh, but people are like how they're like I don't get what you mean by that and I'm like well like you're also not looking on Twitter every day with these people who are like have these like massive massive titties um yeah. so it's it's very interesting how that kind of like uh that's changed my perception in that way mm -hmm. do you see like do you see positive changes in the way that um media is portraying women's bodies now are you seeing more like diversity out there do you think that there's there should be more of it or do you think we're moving in the right direction I mean, there should always be more of it um, because I feel like specifically like with like, I don't know, casting for TV shows and stuff like that, um, people still are like, you know, if someone's cast as a fat woman in a TV show, they're typically like fitting certain boxes that the production wants to fit them in. It's like kind of, um, I find with like in terms of like diverse casting in quotation marks, as much as people try um, to put people in roles that fill like a certain quota um, and also give people, you know, in-depth storylines. I feel like fat people it, are kind of like the last people considered when it comes to that stuff. Like oftentimes if someone's being cast, like a, a fat person is being cast in a role, that role is like, oh, it, they're, they're struggling with their body issues. That's like, like, or, or they're, ha they have an eating disorder. And it's like the kind of the, like, we, we haven't fleshed out just giving fat people roles yet. Like it's like, they have to come with like this burden of being a fat person, um, which mm -hmm. sucks because like, I mean, obviously, you know, fat people struggle with body issues, especially because the way people treat us. But yeah. if that's all we're showing to people, like that's not really a, that's not a, like a, a full diverse representation of the yeah, fat people in the media. And like, an example of that would be um, with um, the show Euphoria. They mm -hmm. had um, an actress who, uh, Barbie Ferreira, who played uh, the character Kat. And she's like a, like a plus size woman. And um, they like wanted to give her a storyline of having an eating disorder in the second season that, that just came out. And uh, she like refused to do that and had a lot of issues with the director. And now it basically was written out of the show because she wouldn't do that which is like sucks because the rest of that show is like very like gives kind of like new life to different perspectives um, and to trans people and to um, like biracial people and like a whole bunch of different like queer characters in there. But then with like the fat girl, they're like, Oh no, you get the, you got the very obvious storyline that Degrassi covered like 10 years ago, um, which, you know, that's just, it's very unfortunate that that happened, especially at, you know, that kind of caliber. That's so interesting that you say that because she was actually the person that I was thinking in my head that I felt was like a good representation of a plus size woman in a show because she is the one who ends up like kind of getting into sex work and camming and like showing off her body. And there's a lot of like, you know, her coming to terms with her sexuality and seeing herself as desirable. But I didn't know that they wanted to give her an yeah. eating disorder storyline. That would have been disappointing. It would have been, um, yeah. Because yeah, you're right. Um, I do, I do. I mean, as much as that show gives me so much fucking anxiety for when my daughter becomes a teenager. Oh my God. Also because I was not a good kid when I was a teenager and I did drugs and stupid shit. Um, but yeah, I like the way that it doesn't fall into like those, those stereotypical tropes, like how the trans character there is like, it's not obvious that she's, they don't really make a thing about her being trans kind of like at all really. Yeah in in the show that and you don't even really realize it until later yeah so i thought that they were kind of setting a good example for that but that's interesting to hear that that was the plan yeah and i'm glad that she fought against that because i agree with you i think that would have been a detriment to the show yeah and to that her story like the storyline of that character yeah. in general yeah it's very wild but yeah it tends to happen a lot and um it's unfortunate that people can't really pull like away from that just yet yeah um, you've done a lot of interviews, um, with mainstream media sites like Vice and Wired. Um, 
how did you establish yourself as kind of a voice uh, for sex work? It's a good question. <laughs> I just, um, I think tweeting um, about my opinions is kind of the what has kind of propelled me into that space of like talking to the media about things. Um, just because a lot of, I just get DMs from journalists that are like, hey, like I see you're tweeting about this issue. Can I talk to you about it? And I'm like, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, I think like when I first started in the industry, I um, had like a lot, like a very, like, I have a lot of models who follow me and like, not just for like the, not for my porn, but just for like my opinions. So I think like when I tweet about something that is kind of like a hot button issue in our industry, like site changes or um, like, like political things, I get like a lot of attention on those tweets. So I think that's kind of like, you know, gets in front of eyeballs and people trust me to talk about things which is very wonderful and like I'm honored that people consider me representation for sex work um so I can talk to people about it but yeah it's um I, I don't exactly know why but that's kind of my best guess what do you think is one of the biggest issues facing the sex work industry today oh goodness <laughs> that's a good question um I mean, payment processors are probably the main the main thing that I would say. Um, just because I feel like if um, if certain religious groups and organizations weren't rallying for um, our payment processors to stop paying us, um, then we could you know create a little bit more freely and exist a little bit more freely online. Yeah, it's interesting because when people ask me questions like that if I do other like podcasts or interviews outside of the adult industry I'm always like people think it's like politics that's going to shut down the adult industry like they're going to make it illegal it's not politics it's the payment processors mm -hmm. that's Absolutely. the biggest thing yeah. the yeah. credit card processors because if Visa or MasterCard blocks you and for those of you who don't know they become stricter and stricter um, with adult content since the whole Pornhub New York Times article, which is a whole other story that I've covered in previous uh, podcast episodes. We won't go into that whole thing now because it's a long story, but um, it's definitely been an issue that we've been facing. Um, speaking of like tech and current issues, um, since the uh, Elon Musk takeover of Twitter, there's been a lot of chatter about that. There's been some concern that Twitter would be taken um, away from uh, sex workers, uh, do you think that, like, what, what do you think would happen if, if Twitter was shut down? That's a good question. Um, I think of that, like, I just think of like opening the app one day and just like nobody being there, which mm -hmm. is very spooky because on other platforms, you know, we have, you know, like, obviously I have like mutuals on Instagram and whatnot, but the community doesn't operate the same way on those platforms just because we're so used to getting booted off of them. And I think um, like places like Instagram or TikTok, they're not really like meant for community building, which I think Twitter, like that's like one of the positives of it, of it is it's like easy to find people within your area and it's easy to connect with them in a way um, rather than like Instagram and TikTok, which are like just like, you know, putting out content. I mean, there is some, you know, some comrade energy there but like it's like limited i think in comparison um it doesn't really encourage like a back and forth dialogue yes yeah exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. you're like there to post something and then someone comments on it, it hypes you up and like sometimes you like you know you send a dm and you message with people but it's not the same type of like yeah communal conversation that's mm -hmm. happening and um like i don't I, I to be honest i don't even know what like the option like is if Twitter's not there, um, yeah. for us, like, I, like, I keep thinking, I'm like, I know, um, like that one site, um, Mastodon or Mastodon, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, like people are saying like, or people on Twitter, not specifically sex workers, but other people are like, oh, we're all headed there. And it's kind of like a Twitter, like hybrid, but that was the place where like, um, like years ago people were put like, it was called Twitter or like sex work Twitter. And, um, the, like, people started moving over there so that like they could like be like, Oh, we have like, got a safe place. But then the site basically like, changed their like community guidelines and cut, cut down that whole section of sex work, like this, this Twitter it was called. And um, 
so it's like okay that the place that people are considering moving to won't have us so um like is everybody like like are we all migrating to a platform that already like has has banned like our section of the internet um which is very frustrating because like yeah like it's twitter's one of the only spots where we can actually like you know post porn to promote it (laughs) um -hmm. like there's literally no other website um other than perhaps reddit but that like kind of operates in a very different way um so yeah to promote things so it's i don't know i really i really don't know what will happen but um i know based on like elon and um just like the things that have been happening at twitter i don't think it's gonna be like a sudden like a big sudden change like i don't think we're gonna like wake up one day and it's gonna be gone i think just over time things are just gonna start falling apart and like perhaps like bits and pieces of the company will be like falling apart i think it'll be a slow a slow descent into the ocean <laughs> and yeah, i think like people hopefully- will just like kind of slowly migrate off of it like like tumblr yeah yeah i think it's like okay like well like this isn't working anymore all right and i think hopefully that time will allow us like allow us yeah allow us time to find a new home but i just i don't see any options right now but you know someone's always working on something so (laughs) we'll see we'll see that is true uh, so you've mainly done solo work, but you've started doing boy girl content again. Um, what made you decide to venture into that? So interestingly enough, I think it was like, I was very early on in the industry when I filmed like my first, uh, like boy girl, like blowjob video, uh, which is funny. Cause at the time it was one of the, it was when I was throwing stuff at the wall, trying to see what stuck. And it was like, um, a local, like friend of a friend of mine who like shoots like very beautiful videos, um, was like hey do you would you like to collaborate and I was like oh like this is in my like check checklist of sex worker things to do is suck a dick on camera so I guess I should be doing that um you know the next step up um and I like did it and it was good and like you know that the video sold but um it wasn't something that like um I don't know it was something that I thought I had to do for this job rather than something that I was like like really like really like I don't know like something that ended up being my my niche, if you will, like obviously like majority of my content is solo stuff and that's what like sells for me. Um, and even like with like girl, girl collaborations or other people that I've worked with, I thought it was something that I had to do to succeed um, and to like be like, you know, doing it in the industry. Uh, but I looked back on a lot of those instances and the majority of the times I was like, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I was just making content for the sake of making content rather than actually like thinking about it and being like, Oh, how can I um, use this in a marketable way? Um, in a, like a, a longer form sense. Um, so I did a couple of like, um, like sex worker, like house, like Airbnb retreat things where you like, you know, all pay in for like staying in some place for like a week and then just like make content together. And I think, um, as much as that was really good for like connecting me with people, I'm still like such good friends with like people I met on those. Um, in terms of the content that I got out of it, because I felt like there was this pressure to be like, you have to be staying up all night to be like shooting as many videos as you can while you're here. Um, cause that was kind of the energy that people brought there. Um, I wasn't producing content that like, I can like still sell. Like, I'm like, why did I make this video with these people? Like, like yeah. just, it just, it doesn't fit my niche or it's like, just not, it's not sellable. Like some, I mean, some stuff is, but like the majority of it, I was like, that was a really bad decision on my part. So um and it's like yeah over the the pandemic too but like just kind of was like there's no really need for me to like need to like I don't need to collaborate with people in order to be successful and make the money that I'm making but um at the same time like I think there is some like like some excitement in terms of like creatively exploring ideas with other people like I, I can only do so much myself so it is like fun to be able to be like hey here's another person it's like fun to kind of unravel like collaborations um and like um the my uh filming partner um like now uh like who I'm making boy girl content with um like he was like a longtime friend and just someone who like is like also he watches porn and he's also very good at directing me in terms of like shots so I appreciate that and it kind of like elevates things and I know also like my fans have just been like because I've waited so long 
since like I last did any of that. They're they're kind of like foaming at the mouth for some like real dick dick content. So I'm kind of ex- <laughs> excited to like dabble into that again and also like um, utilize kind of like um, my like like I'm fully realized in my niche now, so I can like utilize that for those types of videos, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah I I think you're right because for me. I've noticed a shift in the industry. I I know that like a few years ago, maybe like 10 years ago, it definitely felt like I was just churning out content. It was just like, whatever didn't really matter. I mean, you know, I always try to produce high quality content, but there wasn't any thought put into it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't given like any direction from my clients. They were just like, I don't know, make like four solo girl videos, like whatever, you know, make sure the masturbation seven minutes long. And I was like, Okay. okay. Um, and it definitely got very repetitive. And now I produce less content, but with a lot more thought mm. and, um, you know, budget built into it. And it just feels like it's so much, it's just so much better because there, there is this idea that porn is very disposable content. And the minute like something comes out and people consume it once they don't care anymore and they want like the next thing that's just like constantly having to make like porn there's yeah. so much fucking porn out there but i think that there has been a shift i think people you know are more like conscientious of the the stuff that they make i mean at least some people are some people yeah it's yeah it's tough because like only fans i feel like kind of you know like uh, i think mainstream is kind of going in that direction but like with only fan stuff i feel like it is still like very much like you should be releasing like a lot of new content and like mm-hmm. my friends who like like collaborate with other people like it's like when they they're like when they're booking a trip to go somewhere to like work with people or like they're working with people it's like boom boom but they're like just like shooting so much and I'm like like I'm like I like would love to like I like I want to start working with other people because there's so many people that I'm like I like just like I admire and like want to work with um but because everyone's like style like a lot of people's style right now is like just like so like on the go that's not how I create my videos so it's kind of like Mm -hmm. I have to find a way to be able to like to to find that happy medium of like Mm -hmm. one person's kind of style of like pushing out stuff and like coming up with ideas and then also like kind of my approach to just because like I'm like I'm a bit more like sensitive and slow in that kind of way so I just kind of have to find like a place where that can like work together yeah yeah well I mean what's great is that you know you're in a place where you can be your own boss and you can make these decisions. And that's like what the new, this new like sex work world is like, you know, it wasn't like that 15 years ago. I mean, it's, it's so great that performers can really literally like do the things that they want to do and do things their way and, you know, cultivate a very specific audience for what they do. And um, yeah. So, I mean, have that freedom is is pretty cool I think yeah absolutely well Gwen thank you so much this has been such a pleasure getting to know you um can you tell everybody where they can find you online please yes um you can find all the places I am online at gwenadora.com dash links um obviously I'm on Instagram and Twitter at gwenadora xo and at gwenadora that's me (laughs) fantastic and you guys can find me at holly randall on instagram and on twitter somehow i'm still on tiktok even though they threaten to throw me off all the time um that's uh at holly randall unfiltered and then of course if you want to support this podcast and also get access to bonus content like this q and a i'm going to do with gwen right after this join my patreon um that's patreon.com slash holly randall unfiltered thank you guys so much for joining me and i